we'll finish uh, our discussion on Poiseuille flow. So Poiseuille flow is the flow which you have. It's the unidirectional flow which you have in a um, in a in a pipe or between two plates. So I did the pipe case when the flow is driven by a pressure gradient. So you have you have higher pressure at the inlet, lower pressure at the outlet. Um, and so Poiseuille, always associate Poiseuille with flow driven by pressure when the flow is laminar and unidirectional, okay? As opposed to quet flow, where the flow was driven by the motion of the top plate, or essentially you're dragging along the flow. There's no uh, pressure gradient. So we, had, um, so we had a pipe. And you have a delta P, so say this is the pressure at the inlet, you have a pressure, different pressure at the outlet. The length of your channel is L, so here it's a relatively <coughs> short and fat channel, but you know, typically if you're thinking about applications of oil transport or anything, L is extremely long compared to the radius. So this is L, and so you have a radius 2, how do I call the radius, capital R, 2R. And we call delta P the pressure drop, so P0 minus P I. With these conventions, you know, bear in mind that we expect, um, you know, we expect a flow when delta P is negative. Uh, we, we expect a flow when the pressure at the outlet is lower than the pressure at the inlet, if it's pressure driven. Yeah? So just keep in mind here, this delta P looks positive, but of course it's not. If there is flow in the positive direction, then the delta P has to be, uh, has to be negative. <coughs> and so we finished last time with uh, an expression for the average flow. So first of all, we derived the, the velocity profile. The velocity profile looks a bit like this. It's a parabolic profile. Of course, it satisfies the no slip boundary condition because now we take into account the viscous term, so we can impose the, uh, the no slip boundary condition. And we found that the average velocity, I think there was an, an error in my, in the, in my notes. Uh, I think I wrote one quarter, but it was w one divided by four, but it's one divided by eight. Huh? It's delta P divided by eight mu capital L, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> um, times R squared. That's the scale for the average Average velocity. Okay. So now let's have a quick discussion on this result, and let's connect it back to uh, some of the things you've seen in your uh, in your undergraduate uh, education. So what you've seen, so this is flowing a pipe, and oftentimes and many of you may have done this practicum in uh, in our lab. You, know, you define the friction factor, which tells you how much, uh, you know, what the velocity is, the average velo flow velocity, um, given a certain pressure gradient, right, and the, the constant in between is called the friction factor. So, so you've, deci you've defined the friction fa factor for pipe flow. So here we can define the friction factor for um, our pipe flow. And we, so if we rewrite you know, the same equation here, where we have delta P on one side and then everything which is related to the velocity on the other side, then we have the pressure gradient, delta P divided by L, is equal to our friction factor times rho divided by 2, average velocity squared, divided by D, the, uh, the diameter. This is the definition for the friction factor. Okay. And so what is the friction factor for? This is here, the friction factor. Now what is the friction factor for um, a Poiseuille flow, so laminar pipe flow? Now if you identify everything, so if, you, uh, if I have to go, I have to now put this into that form. So I'm going to have uh, rho divided by 2 times um, 
Hold on. Well, let me just rewrite that. So delta P divided by L is going to be equal to um, 8 mu L, uh, 8 mu U divided by R squared. Okay. And so if you rewrite this, um, so you so you'll see your friction factor here is going to depend on the Reynolds number. Right? And so if you rewrite everything, then you find that this is equal to 64 divided by your Reynolds number. This is your friction factor times rho divided by 2 u average squared d. Okay, but essentially you can identify the friction factor for um, a Poiseuille flow. So this here is the friction factor for laminar Poiseuille. Now let me show you the, the curves. I think those are the curves that you, uh, for those of you who did this practicum, uh, have seen. Who has done this practicum, by the way? You know, the big one with the pipe for the different uh, surface things, no? You don't remember that one? No? Well, if you, if you really don't remember that, you can just you know, stop by the lab and go with the bachelor students and, uh, and, and try to, uh, maybe you'll remember, maybe you don't remember, maybe you did it and you don't remember. Um, but there's one practicum on this. And so let me just, okay, here are the curves. Insert. Right, so. Okay, hold on, why can I move this? Guy. Okay, so here is here are the curves, you know, and they're not unlike uh, the curves we saw for drag. Of course, the two phenomena are a bit related, um, and so the uh, the laminar part, the friction factor for the laminar part, is here. Uh, this part of the curve, let me put it in color. This part of the curve here. So here you're, you're relating the friction factor, uh, which is a non-dimensional measure of, yeah, of your pressure loss, yeah, um, to the Reynolds number. Okay, And so this here is, oh it's written there, see, this is the 64 divided by Reynolds number. This is what, this is what we've, uh, we've computed. Yeah? So if you know what the Reynolds number is for a given pipe, you know, you look here, then on this table, this is the, the, the formula, you have your friction factor, and then you can easily get what your pressure drop is um, as a function of the velocity, if you're measuring the velocity, or you know, if you have the velocity, what, what pressure you need to impose to, imp to have this uh, velocity. So no one remember those curves? No, you do, maybe. Yes, well, here. Well, because here, I think in, in this derivation here, they assume delta P, when you write this, you assume delta P to be positive. Yeah, and it's always like, you know, just w with signs, you should always know what the sign is. You know, I think it's really, usually you don't want to learn your formula, for especially for signs. You want to know what the sign is, right? And, and in this case, uh, you know, like it, it depends. It's the same. It, when you, if you're doing microfluidics, you use a lot of this poise, and by definition, because you don't want to carry on those minus signs, you define <coughs> delta P as the pressure at the inlet minus the pressure at the outlet because that's sort of logical. But then at the same time, you know, oftentimes we, we, we've always defined this delta P as pressure at the outlet minus pressure. There are always pros and cons, right? If I define it the opposite, then it's different what, from what I did at the beginning of the course. So <coughs> for signs, always know what sign you expect. That's the best way of not making a mistake, yeah? So I'll put the sign under parenthesis. And this is convention dependent. Now, what happens here? So what? So, what happens here? What is that? So actually, now I, I start to believe indeed that no one of you, of, of you guys did the the practicum. So you know, just do it. Uh, you, you can go. I'm sure Rene will be very happy to uh, have extra students, uh, or maybe not. 
Um, but you know, you, you get different curves for smooth pipes or for like um, uh, rough pipes. Uh, but essentially, what happens here at, in that range of Reynolds between 2,000 and 4,000 is a laminar to turbulent transition. Okay, so the f the flow becomes um, yeah the flow becomes turbulent here, and so something very <coughs> dramatic happens, which changes the friction coefficients, which changes the duration between your average velocity and the pressure loss. Yeah, so so everything with so this here, this is transition to turbulence, to a turbulent regime. Now, just from these curves here, those are smooth pipes here, those are rough pipes. You see that the nature of the wall will affect the solution. You know, if you have a very smooth wall, if you have a rough wall, for what we did in laminar flow, we just imposed a no-slip boundary condition. It didn't really affect the solution. Uh, um, now, that's that's uh, this is because you know the, the turns, you know, turbulence is inherently has to do with instability, and and so you know the, the structure is going to be different, I guess, uh, if you have rough you know, pipes or smooth pipes. Now, I'm not a turbulence person, so if you want to know more about that, you, know, you should probably follow the class on turbulence. Um, yes, so, so the last thing I wanted to say is that, so you see that in this case, uh, the, you know, the, the, the unidirectionality of the flow, so as long as you assume the flow to be unidirectional, you have the laminar solution, and in turbulence, well, what happens, the flow is unstable, so you do have a non-zero component in the v-direction, so you start seeing little vortices, little you know, vertical structures, um, and so the flow is no longer laminar, the flow is no longer unidirectional. That happens at higher values of the Reynolds number, uh, right? But so the, the solution that we derived you know, will be valid up to Reynolds number on the order of 2,000 to 4,000. Know, depending on how careful you are with your experiment, the the, tr the the turbulence is going to be triggered anywhere in that in that regime. So if you are below, if you compute a Reynolds number associated with a pipe flow, to you know, so just take the, the velocity times uh, the length scale, which is the radius in that case, divided by the kinematic viscosity, and you get a number which is below a thousand, you can safely assume that the flow is laminar. Okay, so everything that we've done for Poiseuille flow is correct. So, th so th and, and that could be a Reynolds number which is 0 0.1 or 10 or 100. For all in all of that regime, you know, say below 1,000, at an exam you have the flow in a pipe, in a pipe, and you want to figure out well, you know, is is it reasonable for me to assume that I have a Poiseuille driven that I have a Poiseuille flow? Then compute the Reynolds number. If it's below 1,000, then you can use directly all of the formulas which we've written on the board. Right? If you're extremely lucky, you know, part of the exam would be just rederiving what you've seen on the board. Um, that doesn't happen too often. But you know, <laughs> it, it, you know, just just think if you ever see a pipe flow and you have and you don't know like what kind of regime, what kind of equation, just compute the Reynolds number, and if it's below a thousand, then you can directly use all of the results from Poisson flow. Right? That would be uh, that would be a uh, yeah. That's what you would do. Any question on that on Poisson flow? Okay, so the next thing we'll do is, so we'll continue with unidirectional flows. Um, so those are the flows, again, because the, the, the flow is unidirectional, then the initial term drops out, right? Not necessarily because the Reynolds number is equal to zero, but just because you don't change direction and you are incompressible. Um, but the other term which we have neglected at this point is the unsteady term. So now what we're going to discuss is, we're going to look at what happens when we have the viscous term and uh, the unsteady term. And for that, we'll discuss the startup of some of those typical flows which we've seen. We could do the startup of Poiseuille flow, but actually, analytically, it's easier to do the startup of um, Quet flow. So I'll do the startup of Quet flow. So how does Quet flow, how is a Quet flow established from, say, no flow to now all of a sudden the steady state solution? Um, and then I recommend that at home you do the same for the Poiseuille flow. It's the same, uh, it will be the exact same uh, solution method. So you should try. Uh, you should try and do it. So we'll discuss the startup of. So I make the title uh, general. It's of unidirectional flows, but really I'm just going to discuss um, quet flow here. Um, 
Now, if there is a concept you want to associate the startup with, it has to do with unsteady. Right? We're talking now about unsteady flows. How do you get from zero flow to the steady state solution which we derived? So let's do a quick scaling analysis. At this point, when I, when, I, when I talk about scaling analysis, I make no distinction between dimensional analysis um, and scaling analysis or you know, non-dimensionalization of the equations. It's all a bit of the same, um, of the same motion. So we have a quet flow, two plates, Okay, um, and let me write the gap size here is D, and this is at T less than zero. So before we did anything, and before we did anything, the flow is not moving. Okay, so before we start to put anything, our initial condition, if you want, is a flow which is entirely at rest. So U which will be only a function of y, is equal to 0. Okay. Now then, of course, to make things interesting, we actually start moving the top plate. So we have now same configuration, same back gap size, uh, same gap size, but now all of a sudden, the top plate moves at u. And now I'm just going to assume the top plate moves of course, if you wanted the top plate and the bottom plate to move at different velocities, you could. And I'm just going to call the top velocity u, and assuming that the bottom plate doesn't move. And this is, say, at t equals 0 plus, and the following times. So what do we have? Or really, at the beginning, because of the slip boundary condition, at the boundary, my velocity is equal to u of the flow. But in the bulk of the flow, nothing has moved yet. So only, if you think, a nanoscopic layer of fluid is now being dragged with the, with the flow. But the rest here, the rest of the fluid is at rest. Right? And what's going to happen is that at later times, your velocity profile is going to start looking more and more like this. Right? If I put arrows now, this is going to be confusing. So let me just get rid of those arrows. That's not helping. Okay, so this here happens as, as time increases. Your velocity profile is going to be, you know, the, the velocity, if you want, is going to go, is going to slowly increase in the gap. Right. And eventually, you'll reach a steady state. So my top plate here is going at u. Eventually, I reach a steady state where my velocity profile is the quet profile that we that we've developed derived in class, which is just this linear increasing flow profile. Okay, so here. This is at t plus plus. We reach steady state. Steady, steady. No, steady state. So what concept do you associate with that process? What, you know, how does viscosity, yeah, okay. Now, if you go a step further in terms of, of transport, like what, what typical, you know, transport phenomena leads to the establishment of a steady state? You said that? Yeah, diffusion. Right? It's diffusion of, I mean, in that case, you can think about vorticity if you want to. But the, the problem with vorticity is you, you don't really have a boundary condition for vorticity. You know that vorticity is created at the no slip. So you, you can't think of this, you know, here, at the initial time step, I had, I had a delta in vorticity because you have between this point 
between here and right underneath you have enormous shear so you know that here you have a lot of vorticity whereas here the you know the velocity profile is flat so there is no vorticity and you know that all of this vorticity which is created here now will diffuse towards the bulk right now you can also think about <coughs> about this as velocity and we'll see that the equation for the velocity is the exact same as the equation for um, for vorticity in that case now since we've uh, we've said that now the dimensional analysis you already know what to expect so what are my parameters let me call tau the characteristic time scale the time scale for the transient right characteristic time scale it takes for um, the, the steady state of the quet flow to be established and I have my different parameters so I'll just it's the usual we have u clearly we have the gap size that's the only length scale that we have here you know remember usually in a problem you want a length scale when you don't have a length scale then you expect something like a similarity solution um, so here we do have a length scale so we don't expect a similarity solution tau u d and then our properties here okay our um, material properties and if we think now you already know you're thinking about diffusion so probably uh, the parameter which is going to be important will be the kinematic viscosity, not the dynamic viscosity. Because this kinematic viscosity is has the dimension of a diffusion constant. It, it is a diffusion constant. It's the diffusivity of vort vorticity. Yeah? It's meter squared per second. And now since someone already gave the, wrong, the right answer, I'm not going to uh, go any, any further into the scaling analysis. What you expect is that tau will scale like a diffusive time scale. So always remember that sort of scaling when you have a diffusive, a diffusive process between the time, the time, and the length over which it diffuses. So if you want to know the characteristic time scale for the vorticity to diffuse from the top plate to the bottom plate, right, then you need to look at the gap size. The gap size is d. That's your characteristic length scale, and your time scale will scale with d squared divided by mu. When we looked at the boundary condition, we <coughs> thought the other way around. Like we wanted to know if I have a given time tau by, by how much in length has my boundary condition, my vorticity diffused into the bulk. So in that case, you know, what, we, what we had is delta scaling with the square root of mu times t. It's the same scaling, right? but it depends on what you're looking at. If, you, if, you, you know, if you're thinking you know, by how much you know, in how deep or over which length scale has my quantity, whether it's temperature or, in that case, vorticity, has <coughs> diffuse over time scale t, then you have the length scale scaling with the square root of mu times t. It's the same scaling as saying, well, by how, you know, if, if I want to diffuse over this length scale, how long do I have to wait? Well, in that case, the time scale scales with d squared divided by mu. Yeah? Those, those scaling here you should have, you know, ready, because if, you know, vorticity and viscosity are diffusive processes so just like temperature you need to be able to estimate those time scales so here's my time scale I expect tau to scale with d squared divided by mu <coughs> that's about how long you would expect for your quet flow to be established actually this scaling analysis is the exact same as for Poiseuille flow right? so for Poiseuille flow the, the d would be the radius you know how long does it take for uh, the, 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 the vorticity to diffuse from the boundaries to the to the center, um, the time to establish a Poisson flow will have the same scaling. So if we think, for instance, just to put uh, numbers on that, uh, if you think a typical microfluidic application, so say you have just a simple microchannel have an inlet here and we just have a one you know that's my micro channel and you're just pumping flow from one direction usually so say this is your your drain so you have a little beaker here with everything which you don't want and here you have a little syringe right you just <coughs> push with your finger on the syringe um, you know typical scale what did I take here as a scale I took a micron so let's say that D is about a micron that would be a small microfluidic channel you know if you have a if you have 100 microns people will already call that a microfluidic channel so how long would it take 
for a poiseur flow to be established. So if you're pushing with a syringe, clearly you're creating a pressure. You're, you're, you're pushing the flow with pressure. It's pressure which is pushing the flow. You feel it with the fingers that you're actually imposing pressure onto the, on, onto the fluid. Um, so, so the time would be d squared divided by mu. So micron is 10 to the minus 6 squared divided by the kinematic viscosity of an aqueous phase. So know also, you know, on the cheat sheet, or you know it, or you put it on your cheat sheet, you know, viscosity, kinematic, and dynamic viscosity, or at least air and water, you should have <coughs> available. You know, if you have a very particular <coughs> fluid, of course, I will give you those viscosities, but if you have to, if you yourself are unsure about the fluid regime, you often need those quantities to compute your own Reynolds number to know what regime you're in, okay? So for water, the dynamic viscosity is 10 to the minus 3, and the kinematic viscosity is that divided by the density, which is about 10 to the 3, so it's 10 to the minus 6, okay? And for air, both are 10 to the minus 5, because the roughly the density of air is, is 1, right? 1 kilogram per uh, meter cube. So divided by 10 to the minus 3, a 6, sorry, <laughs> this is the uh, kinematic viscosity, and so you get 10 to the minus 6. So it's a microsecond. So it's really quick. Usually this happens really quickly in a micro channel. If you have a if you have a larger pipe, you need to compute that, right? So it will be longer. But you know, if you're thinking about microfluidic application, you, you impose your delta p, you have a fully established preserve profile within one microseconds. That's that's quick. Right? So this time scale can be um, is usually quick, especially at the smaller scale. Um, so assuming that you have a steady state, you know, it doesn't take you you don't have to wait too long after you you started your flow to be safely assuming that you have a steady state. Yeah. Okay, so let's do now the derivation. So this is one scaling. Yeah, two derivation. Um. And so we'll start directly with the x component of the momentum equation. Uh, and so I'm not going to re-derive it. Remember, the, I think on Tuesday I crossed out all of these terms you know, for unidirectional flows. So just look at what we did for the x momentum equation. The only terms we had left is rho partial u over partial t. Because the flow is unidirectional, we had no terms of the nonlinear inertial term left, so the u grad u term entirely, entirely dropped out. And in the Laplacian, so in the viscous term, we only had uh, the term that had partials with respect to y. Right? Um, so here, this is x and this is y. Now I don't remember if we, this was x and z. You know, y and z always vary. Um, they're sort of interchangeable when you're looking at 2D, uh, 2D planar flow. Uh, and I'm assuming no, uh, no body force, okay? So here, this is the equation that we had for the velocity u, right? What is this equation? Yeah? What equation is that? The fusion equation, eh? that's the heat equation. You've seen it before, so you see, uh, in the equation you already see, you know, we wrote it for vorticity, but now you also have it for velocity. You, know, you can think interchangeably about vorticity or momentum, right? Rho, u, the, the, moment, the component of the momentum in the, um, in the x direction, and you see that it will diffuse. It's created at the boundary, because this is where you impose first the big u, and it's gonna slowly diffuse inside of the bulk of your flow. So I think those solutions you've probably seen before in another setting, but it's the, we're going to re-derive the exact same solution that you would have if you imposed uh, between in the gap temperature <coughs> T on top and temperature equal to zero on the bottom. Right? You would have the same thing. It's the same transport. It's the same, it's the same exact same solution. What is different is what? There are two things which are different. Eh? Of course, in one case, you look at temperature, and here you look at velocity. Those are completely different things. And then your diff the, the scale, the typical scale, is given by the diffusivity. You know, heat diffusivity and uh, momentum diffusivity, they don't have the same scale. They're very different. Right? Those are 
the, the processes all look the same, but the origin is different, and usually you find that in the diffusivity. Right, so there would be another similar problem, which would be a chemical diffusion. Right? So if you released a certain chemical from the top plate, and then you knew the concentration was always, everything is absorbed here, so the concentration would be zero, <coughs> and you looked at the diffusion of that chemical species, it could be an ion, it could be anything. Again, the equation would be the exact same, but of course, then you would look at the concentration of, a co of, a, you know, of, a, of an ion or something, which is a different quantity. You know, it has nothing to do with temperature. It's a different quantity. And the time scale would be very different because the diffusivities of, of ions are really low, you know, 10 to the minus 13. You know, here it's 10 to the minus 6, so it does happen really quickly. Yeah? So that, you know, the physically the processes look the same, but of course they, they, they're related to different... I don't want you to get out thinking, oh, velocity is the same as temperature. No, velocity is not the same as temperature. Those are completely different things, but how they transport in that case is, is similar. And what will be different is, you know, the, you know, how fast that happens will depend on, um, yeah, on the diffusivity of the two. Okay, so we have uh, we have this. So this is all good. Uh, now we're going to write the solution u t. So u is going to be a function of time and a function of y, and we're going to write it as instead of solving for u, we'll solve for u minus the steady state solution because we already know the steady state solution okay so u will write as u steady state solution which is the quet flow which we already computed plus the transient solution which is a function of y and t so here this is our steady state solution remember the steady state solution for u so u steady state is equal to u divided by d times y and this here is the transient solution okay so for the velocity field u I'm just going to write the, the uh, all our conditions for the velocity field first and then for the transient because when I directly did the transient last year <coughs> students were confused okay so what are our boundary conditions well we, we know what the boundary condition you have two kinds of conditions sorry now that you're de dealing with an unsteady problem you have your boundary condition right, and you have your initial condition where you started from so in that case um, our boundary condition is u at for all times at y equals zero is equal to zero and the velocity at all times for all y's so, uh, sorry well let's say for times larger than zero right because initially at negative times my velocity on top was zero is going to be equal to u right and y equals to d is equal to u so those are the the same boundary conditions we have when we derive the the, the quad flow right? there's nothing uh, special about that and then we have the initial condition so here is our velocity uh, at time equals zero and for all y's is going to be equal to zero right? we're assuming we start from I mean, you could have a very crazy initial condition. Eh? You could say, well, you, you initially the flow was the zigzag flow. I mean, in this case, we make it easy by just assuming it was zero. But in principle, it could be anything, your initial condition. You could just transition from a pressure-driven flow to a quad-driven flow. So your initial condition would be a, parab a parabola. Right? If, if you went from having a pressure, or you, you have a pressure, drop in your gap, and then all of a sudden you start to accelerate, then your initial condition is that parabolic profile. Huh? Initial condition could be anything. Here we're just assuming the flow was at rest at the initial times. So the initial condition here is going to be this equal to zero. So how does that translate for our uh, transient, the transient part? Remember the transient now is going to be equal to u minus the steady state. Steady state is only a function of y yeah, because it's a steady state. So, what are the boundary conditions? 
for the transient at any t y equals 0 this is equal to zero yeah this is at on the bottom plate and on the top plate this is equal to zero as well right essentially you write it in that form because the boundary take uh, the boundary condition are taken care of by the steady state if I write u is equals to u steady state plus the transient the steady state already, already makes sure the boundary conditions are satisfied because you solve the steady state just for the boundary conditions, right? Okay, so this is equal to zero, but then the difficulty is more in the initial condition. So you see it here. Now my initial condition for the transient is not zero. So the transient at t equals zero, y, is going to be equal to u, so this, my initial condition, which is zero, minus the steady state. So then I just have here ut, my initial condition is actually minus the steady state, okay? So this is the problem we're, s we're, we're solving here. And we're we're, we're going to solve the equation for, uh, for the transient. Now what is uh, the equation for the transient? Remember, this is my equation for the velocity, for the x component of the velocity. Right. And if I now don't want to solve for u, but for my transient, uh, you, you sh it should be clear. If you if you if you you know if, if you plug in, if you want u into that equation, it will be it will become clear to you that the transient satisfies the same equation because the steady state satisfies that equation. Right. So the trend and and the equation is linear. That's the important part. Then the heat equation is a linear equation. So the equation I have is partial u transient plus mu second partial of u transient with respect to y equals zero. So we're solving this PDE subject to these conditions. So we're solving this. Those are the conditions. I initial condition and we're solving uh, this PDE. Now again, just like yeah? Oh, you're right, sorry. I, I wanted to put the, oh, this is really bad. Yes, this, this would be a very unstable thing. You know, like, even if you try, you, and you'll see, because physically it makes no sense, right? Sorry, I wanted to put the equal, I don't want to put minus signs, eh? so here you want to put the equal here. Did I do that same mistake before? No, okay, here it's okay. I just start, so the, the, the mistake, like a, huh? So you got the double derivative also of uh, u over y, or c? Yes, sorry, uh, you mean the d2 should be here? It's the second partial with respect to y. It's the first part, it's the, it's the heat equation. Here do you have a sink? Oh, because here I have two twos, is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah well, yeah, of course, this is... It's the second partial of u with respect to y. Right? Um, okay, now I'm lost. What was I saying? Yeah. Uh, Yeah, I was going to say something, but I don't remember. So I'm just going to continue. Um, so at this point, again, this is where we thank our applied mathematicians for having you know, thought of many ways of doing nice things. When you have a linear PDE, usually the first thing you will try is to try, because now we are trying to find a solution. And that's, of course, always a difficult thing. And if, if there is no solution, then you will just put it into, uh, into a computer nowadays. Um, but what uh, a plot mathematician used to do is just change this PDE into an ODE. And the way to change a PDE into an ODE when you have a linear equation, so this is a linear equation because you just have U's, 
you don't have u squares or power laws of use, it's just use and use, you use separation of variables. I think you've seen that maybe as a trick somewhere, but this is usually what you do. It's just a generic thing, that's the first thing you would try. Um, and so we'll try that. And it works. Of course, if it didn't work, I wouldn't say we try that. I, I would directly say, let's try something else. Um, and so again, that is just to say that if in an exam you have to find a solution under uh, a separation of variable, that would be that would be written. And I'll probably just write, try and find a solution in that form. Um, it's more, you know, come, you know, remembering that you have to, if the, if the equation is linear, you do separation of variable. That is something which you, know, you would be asked to if, if it was more in applied math or physics class. Okay? But here, that you don't have to worry all of this, just you can clear your mind. This, this, the, the solution method um, is not the focus of the class. So if, if, there is, if you have to assume a particular form for the solution, it will be given in the exam. Uh, I'm just saying that in that case, it's not like you know, a trick. It's the first thing you would do. You would try separation of variables. So let's try and find ut as the product of a function of time only times a function of y only, okay? Now, in principle, there's no reason why it should be like that, but it turns out because the equation is linear, this is going to work. And so you, in you insert then this form for the solution into your governing equation, right? And so my governing equation is partial u over partial t. Now, when, when I take the, 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 the derivative of this with respect to t, I get f prime of t times g of y. So this is insert, this is my ansatz. Insert into uh, my governing equation will be equal to nu times the second partial of u t. My t looks like a z. So my second partial of u with respect to, to y, and so this is going to be f of t times the second derivative of g. Well, it's a straight derivative. The second derivative of g with respect to y, if you want. But there is no, there is no confusion <coughs> here. OK, and then the first thing you will always do, then you will put all of the functions which depend on t on one side and all of the functions which depends on y on the other side. Because the equation is linear, you can do that. So this is a direct consequence of linearity. And so I can write f prime of t divided by f of t equal to mu g double prime of y divided by g y. At this point, you always make the same uh, assumption, you, 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 the same uh, observation, which I think you may have heard but you may have forgotten. Um, t and y are two completely independent variables. You can change t and you can change y independently. There's nothing that links them. <coughs> right? I'm not assuming I'm following a, particle, a, a, a particular particle and t and y are associated because I'm following this trajectory. Uh, I not, I've said nothing about that. t and y are entirely independent. So if I have a function of t which is equal to a function of y, the only way that can happen is if it's a constant. I cannot have t depending on t. <coughs> it's just not possible. Right? What you, can, you can just simply see it here. Just look at this. T and Y are independent, therefore I'm going to hold Y constant, and you see that F prime of F prime of F prime divided by F has to be a constant. So we know that this here has to be equal to a constant, it has to be equal to the same constant. Okay, so um, then you have the choice. You know, which one do you want to look at first? Actually, I'm not going to put the mu here, I'm going to put the mu there. Um, so let's look first at this one. Uh, and this is going to uh, determine the um, the form for the constant. So I'm directly going to put here, like I'm, I'm going to write this constant as minus omega squared, which is weird. Why do you put minus omega squared? J let's say for, for now, let me just allow me just put it as minus omega squared here. Um, you know, of course the constant could be positive or negative. That means that if my constant if omega is positive, everything is good. If my, constant is, is, if my constant is positive, then omega has to be imaginary. And if my constant is negative, then omega is real. Yeah, but omega will be real, and you'll see it here. Why? Because f prime, then, if I do this and I have f prime, 
is equal to minus mu omega squared times f, right? and this is what you want. This is the first, uh, this is the first order linear ODE. Any ODE which is f prime equal to itself, um, this is important because you know it, it takes a while until you remember. But if the earlier you remember, the better. You know, f prime equals to itself is always an exp the solution is an exponential. So when you have an, a first order ODE which is f prime equals to alpha f. The important thing is the sign of alpha, because if the sign is positive, something dramatic happens. You have a, you know, an exponential with a positive coefficient t, it blows up, this is a dramatic event. And if it's negative, then it's also a dramatic event, because this thing is always going to decay to zero. So whenever you see this, whenever you have an OD like that, f prime equals to a constant times f, know that the solution is an exponential, <coughs> right? And you always want to look at the sign of the constant, and in that case, you know, it makes no sense that your solution will blow up in time. Right? You expect the transient, if anything, to go to zero. So physically, you know that this constant has to be negative, and this is why I wrote minus omega squared. Okay? So this is to justify just the sign. So you have minus omega squared. You can rest assured omega, therefore, is real. And the solution, in particular, of f will be a constant times exponential minus omega squared t. This is what you want, right? You don't want a plus sign here because that would mean that your transient blows up. Right? This makes sure that your transient goes to zero. Okay, now the second part is, oh, we reach our time. So I'm going to stop here and I'll see you after the break. <coughs>